my, my job is to somehow make them curious enough or persuade them by hook or crook to get more aware of themselves and where they came from and what they are into and what is already there and just to bring it out. This is what compels me to compel them. And I will do it by whatever means necessary. Welcome to the Black Girls Heal podcast, where we talk about healing our intimacy disorders, unresolved trauma, and building a healthy relationship with first ourselves and then others. Every episode, we will talk about advice you can apply today to break unhealthy patterns and grow in your self-worth. I'm Sheena Lachey, love addiction coach and trauma specialist. Let's begin. Hello, hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Black Girls Heal. Happy, happy day to you. I hope that you are doing well and that you are surrounded by those who love you and that you're also knowing that you are worthy of love. I have a really good friend who, shout out to you if you're listening, I have a really good friend who is really going through it right now. And I want you to know, Um, not just to my friend, but anyone else who may be going through it, that your emotions are not too much for people, that your problems are not too big for others, that you deserve to be seen and heard, and that people who love you want to be there for you, whether or not it is giving you space, whether whether or not it is just sitting with you while you're grieving, whether or not it is um, taking you out and distracting you, sending you funny jokes, whatever it may be, just know that the people who love you take pleasure in taking care of you. And it's important for you to let them. And it's important for you to open your heart to that. Because I think one of the hardest parts of when you're going through crisis and turmoil is feeling that you're so alone and feeling as if there is something wrong and that um, what you're dealing with is so big and so overwhelming that no one could possibly understand. And even if they try to, that it would repel them more. That's not the case. True love, true connection, true pridehood is there to. The only phrase I can think of that relates to it is sitting Shiva, which is not my personal background, but but the Jewish practice of sitting Shiva, which is about holding space and literally sitting with someone for days while they go through a time of mourning. And that is how you're there for them. You're not trying to fix it. You're not trying to convince them that it's not that big of a deal, but that you're letting them go through all the things that they need to go through during that time. And so just know that the people who love you want to do that for you. So I hope that helps whoever needs it. With that said... Transitioning into today's podcast episode, I'm going to talk about something that I have not ever, 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 ever talked about before explicitly on the podcast, which is can a love addict and a love avoidant make it work? And I think that this is probably a question that is in the back of many people's minds that maybe even stops them from going and doing this work because even listening to this podcast, you may be triggered with a lot of realizations, realizations about your own boundaries, about what your own triggers are, your partner's emotions and triggers. And it can be kind of jarring and it can almost make you not want to get started on the work because it's like, well, what if I get started down this road? And that means I have to let go of this person. I have to let go of this relationship and I really, really love them. And I don't want to create problems where it doesn't exist, or I want to try to find every solution I can that doesn't make it seem like this has to be our last stop, you know, on our journey together. And so in today's episode, I'm going to be talking about can a love addict and a love avoidant make it work? Three things that it will take for it to make it work. And of course, there may be more things that come along with this, but we're going to do three for now. And as always, if we want to do a second part, then we will. But that's what we're going to jump into with today. So if that is something that you're interested in hearing about, let's go ahead and jump on in. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Before we get started, let's take a small break to say thank you to this week's sponsors. All right, y'all, I'm low-key so excited to talk about this. Uh, I didn't think that I would be as excited as I am, so I really hope that this helps a lot of people. So as always, whenever I'm talking specifically about love addiction and love avoidance, let's talk about what I mean when I talk about this. 
So love addiction is, stay with me for those of you who know it, the persistent obsession of a person, a relationship, or the fantasy of who you want that person and relationship to be, and mistaking that intensity for love, mistaking that obsession and that overconnection for love and intimate care. And love avoidance is the persistent putting up of walls to avoid feeling emotionally overwhelmed and um, taken advantage of in an intimate partnership. And usually with a love avoidant, there is this push-pull cycle of I want you to be here, but not too close. Um, and there's a lot of control around it, control of how much is shared, um, how much is seen and shown, how much time and energy is 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 given. And so what happens is people who are working through love addictive patterns and love avoidant patterns in a room of 100 people, they somehow find each other. And that's because they match. They are like jigsaw puzzle pieces that fit perfectly together. When some people talk about this phenomenon that you will find someone who matches your triggers, whether or not they are instigating them or provoking them or that they just play off of each other. There's a phrase that goes, "Your their bite matches your wound, right? So their bite perfectly matches the hole <laughs> that where the bite was taken out of. So we'll find people who will injure us or um, trigger us in the same ways that we were injured and triggered before until we actually heal that and we no longer need to subconsciously play that out. So for the love avoidant, for the most part, the love avoidance trauma is that they have had a history of relationships with people who were very intrusive, um, maybe try to take away their power and control, maybe push their boundaries and try to do things with them, to them, for them that they did not want. And so now as an avoidant person, they are they are very intentional about making sure that no one ever takes away their power or crosses those boundaries again. So what do they do? They find themselves to be connected to a love addict, to someone who is all about, do you love me? Do you need me? Um, let's spend time together. What, what are you thinking? What, where are you going? What does this mean? And it is a lot. And it's a lot for the love avoidant, at least. And they do not know how to accurately understand where that is coming from. And then also they are picking someone who does not know how to emotionally regulate, that their emotional regulation is based on what the love avoidant does or does not do. So the more the love avoidant does what they are doing, the more that the love addict kicks her kicks her energy into gear. And so um, love addicts and love avoidants are genderless. This happens in all dynamics. Um, but of course, in this podcast, uh, this podcast is for women. <laughs> or it is targeting women. So, and I know the majority of you who listen identify as women. So that is the pronoun that I'm using. So the love addict finds the person that is going to overwhelm them. They're going to feel like they're clingy. They're going to feel like they're annoying, but not understanding that this is part of the dance that they have actually put themselves into and that they were attracted to this person for a reason. The love addict is attracted to someone who's going to continue to abandon and neglect them and not find them valuable. That is their trauma pattern. So in a room of 100 people, the love addict has so much love to give. She has so much desire to be seen and to be loved. She doesn't find someone who is securely attached and open and available to give that to her. She finds the person who is avoidant, the person who may start off very strong, but then slowly start to drift away. And then she will try to appease and adjust her energy, her mindset, take blame for things that are not her fault, take on emotional labor for things that she should not be taking emotional labor for, all to try to get that avoidant person to come back to her, to choose her, to love her, to change, which is absolutely part of her own trauma pattern. So these two people find each other. And so listening to this podcast, I'm very big about you owning your worth, right? And being very clear about what it is that you need and what you want to feel loved. And so in either one of these dynamics, hearing this, it can be very easy to believe that the only option is to end it. And for many of y'all, it, it will be because the problem is not that the person is bad or that they are wrong, is that you are able, you are willing to do the work to make this work, but they are not. And you have been very attached to this relationship, hoping that you can overwork your part to where it will compensate for what they are doing or not doing. And that is not the case. However, 
if you have two people who come together and they both realize that there is not only something wrong, but that they both have a part to play in it. And when I say both have a part to play it in, I mean that me as a partner, I'm owning that I have a part to play. I'm not saying, okay, well, I have a part to play, but you do too. Like this kind of like, I can't work on me until you admit that you're a problem too. It has to be about your own self accountability and self ownership, which I'm going to get into in a moment, talking about what it takes to make this work. But if you have two people who are like, okay, you know what? We both have our own woundings and maybe. Maybe we can both look at this in a different way and we need to be more curious about what's going on versus accusatory or versus reaction, um, reactive. It will require both of you to do your own work. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into the three things that it takes for a love addict and a love avoidant to make it work. A uh, little heads up when it comes to the sound, the the lung people are about to come. And so you're going to hear some buzzing in the background. And I am not going to wait until later to record this so that y'all can get this as soon as possible. Okay, so the first thing that both the love addict and the love avoidant need to do to make it work, it can work as long as both people are um are doing their own personal work. And one of those things, one of the things that happens when you're doing your work is to practice personal honesty about what you're feeling. Again, practicing personal honesty about what you're feeling. So for the love addict, uh, they are usually used to dismissing and denying what they're feeling for the betterment of the relationship. They have this belief that if they are uh, more flexible that if they are able to see both sides and, and try to express some compromise, if they are more uh, grace-filled, if they are more understanding of what their partner is going through and what is happening in the relationship and practicing some patience with the things that they're working on, they think that that is going to help the relationship, but that's not because you are not showing up as your full self. What makes a healthy relationship is two people bringing fully who they are to that partnership. Now, the way that y'all may communicate about what your personal truths are and what it looks like as far as compromising is a different story, but you can't find how to make a beautiful new entity from the two of you if one of you is hiding yourself, if you're hiding your wants, your needs, your desires, the things that make you tick, the things that you like, the things that you love. If you're hiding those, denying them, minimizing them, changing them for the other person, you're only bringing a shell of yourself. And that is very emotionally heavy for any person, whether or not they are love avoidant or not, because you're putting all of your emotional care into the responsibility of somebody else. And at first, especially for a love avoidant, a lot of love avoidants are used to taking care of people, whether or not they were parentified, whether or not they were forced to be resilient on their own because they had lack of care in the past, or they're used to solving problems. So at first, it may feel normal for some people, but after a while, people will start to feel that heaviness. And it's not because you yourself is a burden. It's because you taking care of you is your responsibility. And so when you give all of that to somebody else and you kind of lean into some emotional helplessness, that person has to navigate their own feelings. They need to navigate what it feels like for them to have this responsibility of your feelings. And then they have to navigate maybe some resentment or stress or overwhelm with having to navigate two sets of people and emotions. You know, that's just a whole lot. And so that's what makes people burn out. So again, for the love avoidant is you being honest with yourself about when someone does something that it hurts and that this is what you need to feel loved and to step up and ask for it. And also to understand that you are the one who's in charge of getting that. So a lot of times what I'll see love addicts do is they'll say, okay, I know this is what I want and I know that this hurts me and they will go and tell the person what they feel and what they need. Okay, great. But that is only, that's only the first part. The second part is when that person doesn't do that, then what are you going to do next? Are you going to sit and pout? Are you going to threaten them? Are you going to argue back and forth with them? Are you going to try to teach them how to take care of you? Or are you going to understand that I have enough self-worth to where this is not what I need? So I know that at the top of this episode, I talked about how a lot of times when we talk about these things, it can seem like the only option is to leave. And that is 
That may be an option, but that's not what I'm leading you to right here. What I'm leading you to is that there needs to be consequences to people breaking your boundaries and not showing up in the way that you want and need them to. That came up a lot this past weekend. So I did have our, our workshop, our Reclaiming Me workshop in Charlotte, and it was great. You know, we had some folks who signed up virtually. We had our ladies in person, and we really dug into this. And boundaries was an issue that really came up a lot and that we probably talked about the most. So when I talk about consequences, that doesn't necessarily mean that you, someone hurts you or doesn't show up for you, and now you have to put all this emotional energy and stress into punishing them. Versus what I actually mean is if someone does not show up for you in the way that you need, then your energy, your presence is a gift. And so that gets withdrawn. And I think what happens with love addicts is there's so much attachment to this person in this relationship being it, that they forget that they are the it, like they are the it factor, they are a prize, they are the treasure. And they feel like the person in the relationship is the treasure and they completely lose that. And so you as a love addict, you need to really focus on what it is that you want and following through with those things. That is what one of the things that we talk about, one of many things related to this that we talk about in the recovery school, the coaching program that I use to help women heal from love addiction, love avoidance, and love deprivation. You know, all these things that I talk about here, the trauma, the ways that it shows up, ways to rethink the ways that you are working through this and actually improve your partnerships. All this is talked about. And so I really What I love to see is when I see love addicts who come into this program who may even be in partnerships with people, realizing that one, they matter, and two, that they can actually ask for what they want and that the world is not going to fall apart. Whether or not the people that they are in love addictive partnerships with are friends, family members that they are overly codependent with, and there may be a lot of toxic dysfunction and enmeshment and or a partnership. And the same thing happens for my love avoidance as well. So of the love addicts, the personal honesty for them looks like being honest about what it is that you want. For you as the love avoidant, is you looking at what are the ways that you are providing distancing techniques? Where are you sabotaging this relationship and also why? So when you first talk to a love avoidant about what's going on in the relationship, they will give you the most um, reasonable and rational justification and receipts about why the partnership that they are in is not the right fit. How that person is annoying, they're breaking boundaries, they don't have the time for them, um, that they're, they're asking to do something that they don't want to do. They have all of these reasons around it. So then when they are challenged about that and when it's pointed to, when the patterns around that is pointed to, then we start to get at, okay, what is underneath that annoyance? What is underneath that irritation? Is it really that you do not know what's happening and you're losing control and you don't really know what that feels like? Is it that you are afraid about what's going to happen? Is it, are you afraid of this love and what it looks like? I was talking to one of my private clients uh, the other day about um, a good friend of hers who was really taking care of her when she was sick. And she was like, yeah, this person, I really like her. And, you know, we get along really well. Um, And when I was sick, she came to check on me. And, you know, like a lot of people who are avoidance or not even avoidance, but just a lot of people. I know I grew up in a house where it was like, don't have nobody. People don't come and just drop by your house for no reason. (laughs) Like you will stay on the front porch and we are not home. We're not even going to come to the door. right? (laughs) So I think a lot of people grew up that way, even if they are not necessarily avoidant. But that's kind of like the energy. Right. And so this is really great person. And so I'm like, okay, well, then. Um, how are things now? And she basically told me that she had created some distance there and she had found some reason um, to not talk to her. And the reason that she shared was not anything that was hurtful or wrong or detrimental, but it was something that she was using as an excuse to create that barrier, right? And when we talked more about it, it was because that, that type of intimacy and love was jarring. It was new. It was overwhelming, didn't know what to do with it. She needed an emotional reprieve from it, even though it was basically what she had been praying and asking for and needing in all of her relationships, right? And so for you as an avoidant is being honest with the fact that you don't know how to receive love when it is good and when it is pure. You know how to take care of people. You know how to be the yes woman for folks. 
you know how to come in and save folks, but you don't know how to receive that same thing that you give to other people. You don't know how to rest. You do not know how to see something as good and to not find the catch-22 or not find a reason to not actually let it be easy for you. And so that is part of your goal. Related to that, the second thing that a love addict and a love avoidant need to do to make it work is to take ownership of their own feelings. So understanding that you are the one who's in charge of your own progress. So again, I kind of already said this in the intro, when it comes to making change in this relationship, it's very easy for you to point to what the other person did. And I think a lot of times people, when they're working through a couple of issues, they skip their own personal responsibility step. To really, because they really want the other person to validate and acknowledge and recognize the pain that they have caused. And that is very important for you to feel that type of validation and that place of being seen. But when you are not validating your own emotions, if you're not the one who also knows how to self soothe and to take care of yourself, honestly, it really doesn't matter what the other person does or does not do. It's almost like you are fighting with the shadows and the ghosts from your past, which is why no matter what they say or what they do, ever feels like it's enough. Or if they say or do the right thing somehow in the moment, that you still feel unease and you still feel lack of trust and you still don't feel safe. You may think it's because what they did was so egregious that you need the time and space to forgive them and work through it. And maybe that is the case. Maybe there is something that happened that was very tragic and very traumatic. But for the most part, especially with couples who are actively mutually working on things together and they have partners who are actually trying to communicate, show up and be accountable. And so they've given their best effort to show up. And so the other partner is still feeling some negative emotions linger. It absolutely absolutely could be because of the breach of trust, but a lot of times it is actually because that person, whatever happened is triggering a core abandonment wound or rejection wound or negative core belief that the partner who feels hurt feels deep inside. And so that's been stirred up. So even though their partner has apologized, made amends, is creating change, they still feel restless because their biggest fear, their biggest wound has been activated. And so who is in charge of fixing that wound and fixing that activation? Your partner or you? And the answer is you. And I think part of our fairy tale that we have when it comes to this deep, intimate love, especially when we see the couples that actually make it work and they have had these best friend relationships and they are, you know, deeply passionate about each other. And they talk about how, you know, they found their person that can feed into either our conscious or unconscious, either our expressed or kind of secret feeling and hope that to be in the right partnership, it will eliminate us from all of this emotional distress. But no, it it doesn't. If anything, relationships will provide a mirror. And even in the most easiest of partnerships, that does not eliminate you from needing to do your own personal work, your own personal healing, your own personal self-development. You know, that person is not your higher power. They may be an express version of your higher power's love for you, if that is something that you believe in here on earth for you. But you're still the one who's in charge of clearing things out and digging up the roots, like I talk about in the recovery school, um, clearing out of all the weeds that are choking out the life of your relationships. You're the one who's in charge of that. And I think especially for love addicts, part of the fantasy is that someone will save us from having to deal with that, right? That this love is going to be so magical and abundant that it's going to save us from that, but it doesn't. Let me pause right here just to reemphasize something that I've already said, which is for the relationships to work for love addicts and love avoidance, both sides need to be doing their own mutual work to make this thing Uh, happen to heal it. So doing their own personal self-accountability work, if or when they see that something is not working with their partner, they are the ones who are initiating the repair. They are the ones that are initiating um, a loving, caring way to move closer together versus one partner always being the one that has to bring it up, the one that's asking questions, the one that's booking the therapy appointments, the one that's always the one who's forgiving more than the other person, the one who's being patient while the other one, insert air quotes, is working through things when really they're just buying time and they're taking advantage of your your desire and your vulnerability to really give them space. 
each person needs to be doing their own work. And if you are tempted to take over for your partner, let's say they do start very earnestly and they start with a with a real heart for it. And they are, you know, maybe they're participating in therapy. Maybe they're they're the ones who are starting the um, couple check-ins to talk about what's going on. If you slowly see that you're starting to take over that, right? And you're starting to overcompensate. And so now, instead of them always initiating it, now you are. And now you're the one who is leading the charge in these conversations. And you're the one who's being more expressive. You need to pull back. You need to pull back and you need to allow them the space to do their part. And that might be really painful and that might kick in, kick up what I'm actually talking about right now, your own personal ways that you need to self-soothe and learn how to take care of yourself during these moments, especially when you're tempted to have that other person be your everything. And for my love avoidance, you got to learn how to start moving towards people and not always looking for the bad thing. You know, one of the main things that I really try to get my avoidant folks to do who are in relationships, um, who join um, my recovery school or who I work with privately, is you have to start leading with love with your partners and not criticizing them. This is like peeling off their skin. (laughs) This is like the most painful, annoying thing ever. For them, because again, they got receipts on why this person is so annoying, all the ways that they have given chances to them before, all the things that they have very clearly and uh, maturely asked of them and this person has not done. And now you're telling me to be nice to them? Bullshit, right? But here's the thing, Carter, your pattern is you will create fires when none exist. And it doesn't matter how perfect somebody is, you are going to find a way to create distance because you have not known loving, kind, true, pure love that wasn't um, biased or reciprocal or didn't have consequences that come with it. So this is how you sabotage things. You don't understand that relationships can actually be easy, right? You you hate that it's so much stress and you don't want it to be so stressful and you want to just you know, be connected to somebody and for it to not have all this drama and yet you bring the drama, but because you're probably more higher functioning than the other person and you look more put together and you're probably able to put these sentences together a lot better, um, you're the one who gets to uh, slip under the radar and the other person gets to look like the problem. But no, hun, you have to be the one who learns how to soften and you have to be the one who learns how to let things flow in this relationship. And again, get at what is this fear? Like, what? where did I learn to over-criticize? That's, that's a free one for y'all. Where did I learn how to criticize? Do I have anyone in my life who has ever modeled how to be good, loving, positive, and affirmative to the people that they love? And if those people were related to me and that I grew up with, am I actually actually mimicking what they taught me, right? As much as I feel like I'm breaking generational patterns, and maybe you are. But in this aspect, am I just create, um, carrying on the community or the family tradition of, of living in ego or talking down to people or finding a reason to not be happy in a relationship? And so these are all things for you to look at. Let's talk about the third thing. The third way that uh, love addicts and love avoidance can make it work is learning how to communicate with themselves first before the other person. Learning how to communicate your wounds and your hurts first with yourself before the other person. Again, I feel like in this dynamic, and I think most couple dynamics, whether or not they you know, feel connected to labels love addicts, love avoidance, I think, I think just people. It's very easy for people to say, okay, this wound happened in this partnership, in this friendship, in this dynamic, it is, and I was triggered by what this person said and did, and so they need to be the one to repair it. And yes, that is true. That, or that definitely has some, some merit to it, right? That if one person was the person that trespassed, that it makes sense that they need to be the ones to be an active participant in making it better, right? makes makes complete sense. However, going back to what I was saying before, a lot of times that we are when we are highly triggered and we are highly upset, it is because we are putting all of the ownership on who is going to make us feel better in the hands of that other person. 
Instead of us learning how to talk to that inner child, talk to that part of us that was wounded, affirm her, love her, talk to her, talk her through what she's feeling and learn how to cradle, cradle and comfort ourselves and get ourselves right so that everything that that person adds on top of that is extra and it's not dependent because otherwise, I know all of you have experienced this in some sort of relationship in your life, whether or not it is romantic, family or friend, you're talking to a person about something that happened that maybe they did towards you or against you, whether or not it was intentional or not. And they are at the place where they are actually making an apology and they're making an effort to say, I'm sorry, or to make it better. But they're not saying it the way that you want them to say it. And it's not because they're being disingenuous. It's not because they are they are doing it because they're obligated, but they're doing their best effort. But you're like, yeah, but you're not getting it. It's because you need them to tailor it and word it in a certain way to try to get at this really deep wound that did not start with them, right? It may have been the most recent event on top of a wound that was already there, but they're not going to be able to say the magic white, uh, magic right words to eliminate the depth that this problem has has in your heart and has in your soul because it didn't start with them. And so until you learn how to take care of that deep wound yourself, that you learn how to become a deep sea diver into that world of your trauma and pain, and come out, right? Doesn't matter what anybody else does, it's never going to be enough. And so you will cycle between relationships, friends, partners, looking for that person that doesn't trigger you in that way. And each person you meet, it may get better and better. You may learn so many things that help you choose better and choose people who may be more emotionally regulated and choose people who may be uh, more expressive and choose people who may be more on your level and on your vibe. However, miscommunications happen. Triggers happen, especially if the deep wounds and core beliefs are there. Something's going to happen that's going to trip over those events. And so it's going to be very easy for you to continue to move around and try to find the perfect fit, but the perfect person in relationship doesn't exist because the problem is starting within. Okay. Maybe the external problem, again, is learning how to choose better partners who are a better fit. However, when you're with those better partners, how do you partner with yourself? How do you love yourself? How do you take care of yourself? Okay. So I hope that this is helpful. This is a little bit of a shorter episode, shorter episode than I usually do, but I wanted to get this, get this out there for y'all. Okay. If these are things that you are wanting to work on, I've already shared a little bit throughout this episode. These are absolutely the things that we work through in the recovery school to help you be your best self with yourself and to learn how to take care of all these triggers that happen in your everyday life. So even when you're single and you have things that are going on at work, you're having things that are going on in your family, you have things that are going on in your own personal journal type, right? And then especially how these things show up in our partnerships. Remember, our relationships are a mirror. They only reflect what is already there. And in our most intimate relationships, things that are already there only get bigger. And they and it's harder for you to discern what is them versus me. And then it's even harder, which I didn't really talk about as much today, to know how to move towards them versus away. You know, I think a really common tactic that a lot of people have when they are going through a lot of turmoil in relationships is to pull back and to quote unquote work on themselves. But in deep intimate relationships, especially for someone who believes in monogamy and long-term relationships, this whole pulling back thing, you know, are you going to leave the relationship, move to a different place, stop talking to them for months every time you go through a really deep thing? If you are in relationships with people who are healthy and good for you, there is a way for you to focus on you while also not having to sabotage and blow up the whole relationships. And I think many of us only know one or one of the two extremes. Either we are solely insular and by ourselves and in this little safe bubble, or we are this place of complete self-abandonment and we're fully invested into a relationship. And so we don't understand, we can't really fathom how does it how does this work, right? Especially if the things that are triggering us is the other partner or the things that the partner is doing, saying or not able to do or say for us, how can I ever 
ever feel better and move forward when them or the relationship or the dynamic is the problem and it's absolutely possible. It's absolutely possible, but you you need help and you support you need support with it because to that point, you are highly triggered. You you are not able to see what is going on. So whether or not it is therapy, whether or not it is something like my coaching or a coaching program, getting outside support and help to help you stay grounded and to help you heal and to help you move towards people who are good for you versus pushing them away is vital. It is very vital. And so I hope that you are making steps to help you work through that. If you're wanting to work with me, the recovery school is an amazing place to start. Um, it is, you can find more, inf- you can find out more information by going to the recoveryschool.com and you can get started immediately. I am actually working on an enhancement of one of my tracks. So when you join, there are different tracks that you can join in addition to the main curriculum. So everything that I've already shared is already covered in the main curriculum. And then you get to pick your own bonus tracks. So there's a dating bonus track. There's one for folks who struggle with love deprivation. And I'm working on one for partners right now. The, the It actually already exists, but I'm revamping it and adding more materials and changing it. So that would be a great direction for those of you who are in partnerships and for those of you who are dating and you're trying to find your people or trying to find relationships that feel really good for you, then joining the recovery school and joining that dating track will help you with a whole 360 holistic experience of it. So you can go to the recoveryschool.com and find out more about it. And I actually just added a a link to watch our latest open house. So some of you know, I have open houses where I go over the program in detail, what it entails, um, what to, what it expects, what to expect, how we help you solve the problem and what problems we actually solve and what it looks like. And, um, all of that and answer a whole lot of questions because I've been teaching this program for, or versions of this program for the last, six, six years or so. So there's a lot that goes into it. And so that open house, I have a replay of my most latest open house, especially for those of you who haven't been able to attend to sign up and watch it and learn more about the program and see if it's the right fit for you. So you can learn all about all those things by going to blackgirlsheal.org slash program or going to the recovery school.com. And you'll be taken there directly and you can either enroll and get started today or you can watch our open house to learn more information. And if it's the right fit for you, I would love to have you in and to help you make these real lasting changes in your relationships, especially if you're already connected to someone that you love who is either love addictive or love avoidant, or maybe y'all switch sides, which is very common in dynamics as one person pulls away and then the other person starts to change a pace and try to change things. And then when things go back to how they used to be, it flips to the other side. So we want to get you and your partner out of that hamster wheel, get you off of that roller coaster. So again, the recoveryschool.com. And I hope I get to work with y'all soon. All right. That's it for now. I'm sending you all so much love and I'll see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves.